Uh, police, emergency. Oh, police officers! Elite police units created to crack the toughest of cases. My role was investigating serious and organised crime. This was out of the ordinary and this was a high pressure situation. Hey, hey, hey. Calm yourself down! Their task, tackle the villains. The lots of us for murder, all right? And bring them to justice. A real who did it? With unique access to some of Britain's most talented detectives, we explore for the first time their investigations. I've spent years putting together all of these tiny pieces of evidence. Their methods. The most bizarre investigation I've been involved in. And the evidence that's put some of the UK's most dangerous criminals behind bars. They look clever and they're dangerous. Murder is one of the most savage crimes possible. The injuries are some of the most brutal injuries I have ever come across in my service as a police officer. There is 164 impact points on Michael's body. And for detectives across the UK, investigating such killings are always a challenge. Are you dead? No comment for the third time. Finding evidence that proves beyond reasonable doubt a suspect is guilty is sometimes no easy task. That's not good. You meant to be a detective. I've been with Lancashire Constabulary now for 21 years, predominantly as a detective. Lancashire's a lovely place to be, lots of things going on. Like any area, unfortunately, there is instances and isolated instances where crime occurs. I've always had a passion to be a police officer, um, mainly because I think I get satisfaction, reward from helping people. Working in the homicide team and the force major investigation team enables me to do that to people at the most uh, difficult periods of their life. Uh, police, what's your emergency? At 12.54 p.m. on the 8th of November, 2021, Emergency services get a call. A man named Michael Briley has been found dead at his home in Nelson, Lancashire. The call came in from Michael's partner. She had reported that Michael had been to the public house the night previously. She had told us that whilst at the pub, Michael had been assaulted, made his way home, got home and collapsed and she'd found him in the morning. The major investigations team immediately go to the scene. I arrived in partnership with the crime scene manager, Gemma Cropper, who's experienced in dealing with similar offences previously. One of the first things that we do when we arrive at scene is to photograph the scene sort of extensively. So that's just to try and capture everything before anything's been moved. So that would involve going into a room and literally a term called quartering. We'd quarter each room and photograph extensively. So that would form our general shots. As the CSI team methodically work their way through the property, DCI Davies evaluates the scene. Going into any crime scene for me, I have a job to do. My objective is to make sure that I can understand and interpret that crime scene in the most effective way possible in order to get justice and understand exactly what's happened and what the circumstances have occurred. It was quite clear early on there was only one way in and one way out of that address. Equally, when I entered the address, Michael was still present. He was laid prone between the bathroom and the hallway. Straight away, it struck me the injuries that Michael had to his face. He had clear injuries to his legs, um, and it was quite clear to me that he had been the victim of an assault. There was blood in numerous areas of the premises, albeit some of those didn't look to be fresh. Some of it looked like it potentially been cleaned. Identifying a suspect and finding evidence fast is key. So the golden hour, as investigators call it, when evidential materials are unspoiled and available at the crime scene is crucial. DCI Davies puts a plan into place immediately. So the way we approach this type of investigation is to set clear strategies. We'll look at it from numerous different perspectives. We'll look at it through CCTV to track people's movements. We'll look at witness accounts, digital, forensic. Every possible element of an investigation, we will start to look to unlift every stone we possibly can. As soon as officers and first responders arrive, the scene is sealed for forensic recovery. Forensic recovery takes precedence over the search because you can't compromise one over the other. What we then had to do was conclude our forensic search of Michael's home address. 
In the meantime, a team of detectives collect available CCTV and they begin door-to-door -door inquiries with neighbours and pubs in the area. But for the crime scene manager, Gemma, something doesn't add up. So from the information that was being fed to me initially from one of the other witnesses within the, the scene was that a fight had occurred elsewhere. The scene wasn't presenting in that way. So where the deceased lay, it was just a sort of contact blood and just blood pooling on the floor. However, the further into the property that you got, you could see that there was evidence of airborne blood, which would suggest that there'd been attack site had happened at that scene. It means Michael may have been attacked at home rather than in the pub, as suggested initially by his partner. Gemma realises they need a blood pattern analyst. So that would involve asking a BPA to come to scene and help assist with regards to interpretation of the blood that was throughout the scene, being able to comment on attack sites, if there'd been any evidence of clean-up. Blood pattern analyst Brian Hignett arrives at the murder scene. First thing we saw was the body of Michael. He was laid in the hallway on his back. He'd obviously suffered significant head injuries and leg injuries. The first thing that struck me, despite the fact he'd sustained such severe head injuries, there was very little blood staining around the walls and the door where he lay. If Gemma and Brian are right, the pub assault story can't be true. The evidence suggests Michael was attacked at home, so detectives suspect they're dealing with murder. My immediate concern was to confirm or negate the validity of the fact of the assault that had taken place in the public house, or whether or not potentially the fact that blood was present had that assault actually taken place within the home address. To start the process, DCI Davies pulls together a large team of detectives to begin door-to-door -door inquiries. Over 50 police start asking neighbours what they know and questioning landlords in local pubs. The neighbours indicated both Michael and his partner had been physically abused for some period of time, unbeknown to the police. Neighbours even named the individual who was allegedly abusing Michael and his partner in an illegal practice called cuckooing. Cuckooing is a form of crime in which vulnerable people are targeted in order to almost take over their own life, take over them financially, and take over them physically in terms of everything they do, usually in order to facilitate um, drug usage or dealing of drugs. Cuckooing is a nationwide problem and is often connected to the county lion's drug trade. One in eight Britons have seen signs of it where they live. In 2021, police identified nearly 900 addresses across the UK where cuckooing was taking place and vulnerable people, including children, were at threat. Officers learn that both Michael, known as Amos, and his partner are vulnerable and sadly easy targets. It's quite clear that Michael was a loved individual loved by everybody around him. He was a kind individual, he was a caring individual, and he's an individual that certainly did not deserve to have this happen to him. And all I want to do is to obtain justice. Later that day, the huge team of officers scouring the neighborhood get a break. Some CCTV from a residential security camera shows Michael with the man neighbors claim was cuckooing him and his partner. Emergency. Lancashire's major investigation team are probing into the potential murder of 48 year old Michael Briley from Nelson, Lancashire. When we get to the scene, we treat it like reconstructing a jigsaw puzzle. Most pieces of the jigsaw are there. Connecting a suspect to the crime is always the most difficult task for detectives. And at the scene, forensic scientist and blood pattern analyst Brian Hignett is looking to do just that. It's our job to go around to find blood patterning, to examine them, to see exactly what they mean, to build a picture, put those pieces back together. What has happened? Where has it happened? Who's done this? Brian's task is not easy. At first glance, the scene is not clear cut. 
In 30 years, I don't think I can ever recall ever seeing injuries that severe being inflicted by somebody being assaulted. They appeared to be more akin to somebody who's been involved in a road traffic accident. It was clear he couldn't have walked with those injuries. So part of the jigsaw puzzle for us was how has he received those injuries and where has he received those injuries? At this stage, police still aren't sure how or where Michael died exactly. It's a methodical, painstaking process. We systematically work our way through the address. We look at all areas, trying to identify any blood. Is there any blood patterning? Is that blood patterning and telling us anything about what happened in the events leading up to Michael sustaining his injuries and subsequently losing his life? Exploring the detail of the scene soon reveals something of significance. There was very little blood in the hallway where Michael lay, but when we went into the lounge, we then found significant amounts of blood staining and blood patterning. In particular, there was a single-seater sofa in the lounge. The seat back and the seat base were heavily blood stained, so much so that some of that blood had actually run down the front of the sofa and had pooled on the floor underneath. Behind the sofa and on the wall, there was blood patterning, what we termed impact blood spatter. It's this blood spatter which answered the question of where Michael had been assaulted. He'd been assaulted, sat in that single-seater armchair. This discovery appears to confirm police suspicions. Michael had been brutally murdered in his own home. Blood pattern analysis and intel from door-to-door -door inquiries turned the case into a murder investigation and Lancashire Police now launch Operation Flaxen. DCI Davies goes back to Michael's partner, who's still in shock, and learns she lied about the pub assault in her 999 call. And the reason why is chilling. Michael's partner summarised it as the suspects had taken over every aspect of their life. Officers now understand Michael and his partner were victims of cuckooing. Michael had actually had all his benefits paid into the person's account, and he was charged £40 for the privilege of doing so with no appeal. There'd been a history of assaults that had taken place. Michael had asked people specifically not to report those assaults. We now know that's out of fear. And the individual who Michael and his partner were scared of is evidently on the CCTV that detectives have secured from the streets around the crime scene. He certainly appears to be connected with Michael. And what DCI Davies witnesses is not pleasant. Two key things are highlighted to me there. He's walking with a stick. He's a vulnerable individual in his own right. He's walking approximately 10 to 15 metres behind. He then subsequently strikes Michael to the face and punches him unprompted. They then make their way to the shop. On arrival in that shop, it is very clear and evident that he is abusive further to Michael in that shop. He's being derogatory in the way he speaks to him and he's treating him horrendously. The CCTV confirms the neighbour's witness statements and elevates the man from a person of interest to prime suspect. Whilst the CCTV en route to the shop is a clear piece of evidence for us to consider around building the chronology and shows a propensity for violence, and particularly propensity for violence towards Michael, it does not provide evidence that he is responsible for Michael's murder. What we need to do is piece together the evidence that demonstrated that he was responsible for that offence. DCI Davies' major investigation team is now nearly 60 people strong. Their task, to find physical evidence linking their prime suspect with Michael's murder. It was clear from the CCB there was quite distinctive clothing that the suspect was wearing. Very distinctive beige jacket. You can see a clear Burnley football shirt and grey joggers. I knew that once he was wearing those clothing earlier that day, there was a strong possibility he was wearing them later that afternoon. They represented significant forensic value for me, and it was important that I recovered those clothing. The more time passes, there's a risk. Al knows a suspect could destroy any contaminated clothing 
so he calls the team on the ground to see if the items can be found. When we became aware of the grey joggers, the focus then at that point was just to recover them as quickly as possible. It's nearly 13 hours since the murder of Michael Briley was reported. And through CCTV, detectives locate an address where they believe the suspect might be hiding. Careful planning goes into any arrest for the safety of the public, for the safety of the officers who are going to carry out the arrest, particularly when you're looking to locate a man who's potentially committed such a savage and brutal attack. They were carefully planned officers, carefully well briefed, and knew exactly what they needed to do when they arrived. At 1.30 a.m. on the 9th of November, officers raid the address. Seven. Mr. Police, open the door. We're going to put the door in, all right? Can you open up? Open the door or else it's going in. When we arrived and entered the address, he was clearly like a child hiding under the duvet in a manner which he thought we wouldn't identify. Why? Stand up. Stand up. Put your hands behind your back. Put your hands behind your back. At this point in time, the lots of suspicion of murder, all right? So you'd have to say anything. But if you have any defense, don't mention any questions until they sign in court. I think you do say anything, we have evidence, okay? In fact, we were able to identify and arrest the suspect swiftly within that first 12 hours, maximise our forensic opportunities. Him as a scene could enable us to get forensic evidence for him as an individual. With the cuckoo suspect now in custody, DCI Al Davies and his team have an initial 24 hours to unearth enough evidence to charge him with Michael's murder. He came across to me as an individual as arrogant, as cocky, which was completely Indicative, I think, of someone who's prepared to cook it with a beagle. Back at the station, questioning the cuckooing suspect starts in earnest. As part of this investigation, I had to rely upon specialist expert interviewing officers. In this case, we used Detective Constable Dave Richardson, who's an expert in his field. For DC Richardson, there was also a personal connection with the victim. Before joining CID, I worked at Nelson for 15 years, and I was the, the local body. So I used to walk around the streets, and Michael and his partner used to live on the area that I covered. So I would regularly see Michael, and I'd regularly see him walking about with his stick. He would walk around with his Burnley shirt on. He was a big Burnley fan. I was disgusted looking at the CCTV the footage was quite upsetting in a way because that's the last time Michael's seen alive. So it was all, all very sad. It's now 10 to 7 in the evening and there's only six hours left of the initial 24. The pressure is already on. When I met the suspect at first, he was generally quite quiet. People usually are. Um, he's probably weighing me up a little bit, and I'm weighing him up. And so begins the interview game of cat and mouse. My interview plan in this instance was initially to go through the timeline with him. So he was arrested in the early hours of the morning. What I needed to cover was all the time from the day before the murder, all the way through the murder, to after the murder, to the point where he was arrested. So where were you? If you don't want to answer, just say no comment. No comment. Okay. You can answer if you want to. Where were you? No comment. Okay. Half the time they're advised to go no comment, so if they go no comment, I just follow my interview plan. But with the suspect stonewalling DC Richardson, were you in possession of any weapons? No comment. Were you under the influence of alcohol? No comment. It looks like it will be a long night. Are you responsible for assaulting Michael Briley, also known as Amos, causing him injuries leading to his death? No comment. Okay, 
So just to clarify, at the time... Do you need a legal break or do you want to continue the interview? Um, yeah, can we have a legal break, please? Lancashire police have tracked down and arrested a person they suspect of the brutal murder of Michael Briley. Frustratingly, he's refusing to cooperate in questioning. No comment. After securing CCTV from neighbouring houses and then wading through hours of footage, investigators find a tantalising clue. The suspect appears to be leaving Michael's house at 12.43 on the day of the murder. I think the timing is important there in terms of where the suspects have left. It's only two minutes after the call is made to the ambulance. It placed him immediately in the area prior to the offence. It means the cuckoo suspect was present when Michael's partner called 999. And if he was the killer, she would have seen her partner, Michael, savagely murdered in front of her eyes. It's a chilling thought and helps explain why she claimed his injuries were from the pub assault. It gives some degree of explanation as to why a victim of cuckooing may elect not to tell the truth. It's quite evident that fear is apparent when you've got someone you are fearful of is still present within the address. You are unlikely to tell us the correct story. With less than 12 hours left of the 24, the victim's body is taken for post-mortem. It means the forensic team can begin a detailed fingertip search for evidence in the property. We recover any items we consider to be of interest, recover them for future examination, further examination in terms of blood, blood pattern, DNA. At Police HQ, DCI Davies' team continue to scour the CCTV to build up a timeline of events. They follow the suspect from the scene. The suspect had left the address. He left now very clearly having changed his clothing. He'd removed the base jacket, the Burnley shirt and the joggers and is now wearing a distinctive pair of orange shorts. This makes recovering the Burnley top and joggers even more essential. As he left the address, it was quite clear and obvious he was walking the manor, it looked like he was potentially uncomfortable. His gait did not look correct and he was walking away from the scene. That is reaffirmed by the fact that we follow the CCTV through to his home address. En route, he then removes that footwear. He left now very clearly having changed his clothing. For some reason, he carries that footwear and then makes his way towards the shop he was at earlier that evening. What becomes obvious is that he then discards the footwear he'd previously removed and throws them over a wall. It would appear he's not happy with the location of those trainers because he then proceeds to jump over the wall again in order to, I would say, to move the location. Even though this appears damning, the video evidence is still only circumstantial and wouldn't hold up in court. That was important for me. I needed to know whose footwear that was and whether they have been using the commission of the offence. The police now start to feed what they've learnt into the interview room. We got some really good CCTV in this case, which clearly showed the suspect assaulting Michael in the morning before the murder. It was obvious it was him. Did you slap him? Yeah. Well, can you show me how your hand was when you slapped him? Like this. OK, so you should show me the palm in your hand. Yeah. yeah? So palm in, slap. Yeah. And then, as we showed him a bit more of the CCTV, he then went back a bit on that. The chap stood on the corner there, is that you? What are you saying? See? You can't see the face. So, how, how could that be me? Are you, are you saying it might not be you? It might not be, yeah, because I was under the influence. Well, I know at that point that he's responsible for that assault. I think, I'll be honest, everybody in the room knew he's responsible because we were all watching the same CCTV. But I carry on with my questions and see if he wants us to give us more information about it. Do you admit that in that CCTV you assault Amos? No comment. So when we showed him the CCTV from inside the shop, it was really clear. It was in colour. 
and we could hear sound as well. Thank you. It's quite incriminating as far as the suspect was concerned, and he, he clearly wasn't happy about looking at it. Right, and he looks perfectly all right. All right, okay. His cheeks bleeding, it's best for nothing. Yeah, it's picky. So he's picked something on his face that's caused it to bleed. That's yeah. right. It's not a result of you punching him in the face. I've not punched him. Like I said. <clears throat> Did you hear that? Well, I can't. No, no, no comment. OK. The CCTV, it wasn't good for him because it didn't show him in a good light. So at the moment, I've just asked you about the assault that we believe you've done against them. And I've just said no comment. Okay, I'm just telling you what's going on. And I was telling you what I've just said. And the more questions I asked him, the more unhappy he was. So that's that. Nothing else. It's 16 hours into the police's statutory 24, and while the suspect is being questioned, the crime scene team makes a crucial discovery. A beige jacket was found in the hallway. We found in the lounge behind the couch a Burnley shirt that was on the CCTV. And in the kitchen, there was a pair of heavily blood-stained jogging bottoms were also believed to be the clothing on the CCTV. It would be marked up as a priority, so it'd be a priori priority submission that we'd sort of rush out the scene. With the clock ticking, DCI Davies makes a decision to fast-track all the items for analysis and extend holding the suspect for an extra 12 hours. When we find something like that, it's a sense of achievement, but well, that's only the first part. We have to examine those in more detail. We can't do that at the scene. That has to be done back at the lab. And it's only when we examine it at the lab, the detail becomes more apparent. But there is still one major challenge for the team. They have no idea what was used as a murder weapon. Despite the extra time to hold the suspect, their questioning isn't getting anywhere fast. Why do you so much? No comment. If we could ask Michael, what would he say about it? You'd have to ask him, huh? I was disgusted when he said it. I think you can probably tell in my voice the way I reply. No, I can't ask him, can I? Because he's dead. I think at that point, I wanted the suspect to sort of understand that, you know, the serious we're talking about. Your friend, supposedly that you've spent however long with is your friend and now he's dead. Everything now relies on getting a positive ID result from the forensics. Knowing there's an individual in custody that has been questioned in relation to the incident, there is pressure. There is pressure to get a result which could further that investigation or could result in releasing that individual from custody. Even with fast-tracking the forensics, it's looking unlikely the results will be back before the new deadline is up. So DCI Davies manages to persuade the magistrate's call to extend custody for a further 36 hours. If we reach crossroads of 96 hours, we have to then release an individual who potentially has committed the offence of murder, which could jeopardise public safety. For me as an SIO, I do not want that to occur. The race is on. The team now has a day and a half to gather the proof and officially charge the suspect with Michael's murder. That period is intense. I will not see my family. Many of my investigation team will not see their own families. We will work long, intense hours just because we are so focused upon getting the right result within them time constraints. With 18 hours of the allotted time already used up, in the interview suite, the suspect wants to further frustrate DC Richardson. Okay, so just to clarify, at the time... Just a break, or do you want to continue the interview? Um, 
Jag kommer jag väl i Bradford. Just remind you what we spoke about earlier. Oh, and no comment. Okay. Can I just ask, are you intending to contact another interview where you're going to put evidence to him or not? Or tonight? Any time, whether it's tonight or tomorrow. It's highly likely there'll be another interview. 2021. By the next evening, the suspect has already been interviewed twice. But now the post-mortem report has come in. The details are shocking. Michael sustained three separate skull fractures. He had a complex nasal fracture to his nose. He had seven different rib fractures. In totality, he had 41 external injury points of impact. He had 23 injuries to his hands, inclusive of defensive injuries. It's quite apparent Michael had fought for his life. He had a laceration to his liver as a result of strikes. The injuries for me are some of the most brutal injuries I have ever come across in my service as a police officer and working within major crime. There is 164 impact points on Michael's body. The nature of the internal injuries are quite harrowing, even for me as an SIO. Although the suspect hasn't been cooperating, it's clear a further round of questioning starts to wear him down. It has been what, like you said, how many days since this event that you're talking about? What does that show you? Show me anything. I'm sure isn't, isn't it surely the police are doing a, a very excellent job? The suspect in the interview, his body language showed me a few times. There are a few telltale signs when you interview people. There's one, the leg shake. That happens quite a lot, where as soon as you start asking a difficult question, at that point, someone who's been perfectly still, the leg will start to go up and down, and they can't help it. It just happens. So that's a good sign for me. So I think, right, OK, I'm getting somewhere here. The trainers now become the focus of DC Richardson's questions. So what could be a pair of trainers, black trainers? Do you know anything about those? Could they be your black trainers? No comment. And why are you going to the back garden? For a slash. A slash. OK. To, to you in it, for a wee, is that what you mean? For a... OK. And you climb back over. The garden wall at 26. Yeah. So you're out of, outside for six <clears throat> seconds. Yeah. You've had a week in that six seconds. Mm. If you now decide you want to keep them, or, or do you think I need to hide them better? No, I don't want to do that. Shame my mind. I think mean, I'm not going to hide anything anyway. And while the suspect is denying everything, miles across town, a police search team is hunting. Bingo. Lancashire police are in a race against time. They only have 36 hours to find enough evidence to charge their only suspect for the murder of Michael Briley. A search team is hunting for some trainers the suspect discarded whilst caught on CCTV. Just nothing. Bingo. Trainer. There's another trainer. Two trainers. OK. The trainers are swiftly sent for forensic analysis. In the interview suite, the suspect has no idea his hidden trainers have been recovered and is increasingly unhelpful. Are you dead? Okay. Can you reverse it and play it again? Why are, you, why are you spinning things for? No comment for the third time. You're asking me the same question. And that's what I have. Because you're not very good at hearing things. What time was the call made? I have no idea. That's not good. You're meant to be a detective. Sometimes in an interview, it is quite difficult to remain calm. 
especially when you've got someone who is arguing with you a little bit, trying to wind me up. I might get wound up a little bit, but it's just important that I don't show that, and I just outwardly try and look calm. Shall we move on? If you wish, stay now. Despite all the clothing evidence found at the scene, one crucial artefact is still missing, the murder weapon. For me, what stood out was the fact that we were outstanding a weapon and there was a bed that was a medical bed, but it wasn't in use. I noticed that there were bits that were no longer attached and they were sort of hidden under the bed. These objects are sent off for investigation in the lab. When we examined the bedpost microscopically, there was blood staining. There was blood staining on the inside surfaces. There was a small amount of blood staining on the outside surfaces. There was also body tissue, fatty tissue on the inside. And associated with the fatty tissue was some hair fragments. The tissue samples are sent off for DNA testing to confirm if they are Michael's. While in the interview room, DC Richardson is breaking down the suspect's defences. He's been held for over 48 hours at this point. Did you intend to cause him really serious harm? No comment. Did you intend to kill him? No comment. Was that a no or a no comment? Comment, no comment. Now, considering at the beginning of the interview, he said the words, no comment. So he knows how to say no comment. But to me, the answer, no, and then a massive gap comments clearly means he's, he's answering the question did you intend to kill him no comment was that a no or a no comment comment no comment where was he when you last saw him no comment with it getting close to the wire it will soon be time when police have to either charge or release the suspect. And the evidence is stacking up. We found blood matching Michael on the beige jacket, on the Burnley shirt, and on the jogging bottoms. It's a start. The trainers have also tested positive for Michael's blood. The CCTV demonstrates we can attribute those trainers to him as that enables us to link those trainers to the commission of the offence. But it still isn't sufficient to convince the Crown Prosecution Service to charge him. What's needed is his DNA profile on the clothing. Three days into custody and questioning becomes intense. He's got some horrific injuries. I know. So how have they been caused? I don't know. I don't know if you caused those injuries. I haven't, no. I've told you the truth now. I got worried. I can't stand the sight of blood. I can't stand it. I, I start fainting. I think throughout the interview, it was obvious that the suspect was only really interested in, in himself. He didn't show any remorse. Who do you think caused those injuries? He could have got injuries from the drug dealers or whatnot because he owes him a lot of money. He blamed the victim's partner. Yeah, they've been fighting all night. But look, you can check my hands. Look, look, I've not been punching no one. Yeah, look, hmm? nothing. You check it. In the last interview, he blamed his girlfriend. So he blamed all these people in the interview, apart from himself. With the clock running down, the suspect has been in custody for 80 of the allotted 96 hours. Finally, the proof they all need eventually arrives. When we obtained the DNA profile from the blood on this bed frame, that was also found to match Michael. That was the weapon or the implement that had been used to inflict the injuries to his leg and to his head. With the murder weapon confirmed, Brian also has the results from blood splatter analysis. So in an assault, you first of all need to get blood to the surface of the skin. So that could take multiple blows before blood starts to be shed. It's only once the blood has started to flow and is free flowing, and it's only then once subsequent blows 
were inflicted into that blood, that's when you get blood spatter. It's the force of the impact into that wet blood that produces the blood spatter, which will deposit itself on an item of clothing or a weapon. The importance of the airborne blood is that it demonstrates that the suspect was either in close proximity at the time the offence took place, or he is responsible for that offence. The presence of blood spatter on the clothing shows that force has been used against Michael Briley. It's the news they've been hoping for, to bring the killer to justice. But the police still need to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the suspect had been wearing the clothing at the time of the killing. We took samples from the cuffs of the grey jacket and we took samples from the cuff of the Burnley shirt. Those DNA results came back and the DNA of the suspect was contained within those profiles. It's the final piece of the puzzle. Finding the suspect's DNA on clothing covered in Michael's splattered blood is incontrovertible proof he is the killer. On the 12th of November, four days after Michael Briley's death, the suspect, Naeem Mustafa, is charged with murder, a result for the major investigation team. The fact that we were able to charge the suspect within the 96 hours available to us demonstrated the extraordinary effort of the officers, the dedication, the commitment each and every one of them uh, committed to this, uh, this investigation. This is actually why we do what we do. This is what we always strive to achieve. We want to ensure the family and Michael, um, the person responsible for this offence, is brought to justice. On the 9th of May, 2022, Michael Briley's murder trial begins at Preston Crown Court. I think it is awful that an individual would put a family through a trial after the offence they've committed when there was such overwhelming evidence of guilt. After less than three weeks in court, the jury returned their verdict. The suspect was found guilty at trial of Michael Briley's murder. He received a mandatory life sentence to serve a minimum of 27 years. I would describe this offence as a cowardly act on vulnerable people, a disgusting, a despicable act, something that I would not expect anybody to have to endure. This case will always stay with me. It's a case that I will always remember the time I have entered that address to see poor Michael lay out on that floor. The result achieves justice for Michael and his family, but the fact remains that across the UK, more and more vulnerable people are becoming victims of cuckooing. The term cuckooing and the fact that cuckooing occurs is becoming more and more recognised now around the country. Um, it does happen. What I'd be keen to do is make sure, and this is one of the things that family are keen to do, is make sure we can try and prevent other people being victims of cuckooing or something that it leads to, as in this case, the most tragic of outcomes. So if people know of anything, I can only ever appeal to them to come forward, share that information, we will always respond to it. <laughs>